show up, have all your applications in. People need to start applying for some of these scholarships. Frontier is all about, we're going to take you where you want to go. And if people don't want to go there, there's no good reason for us to service it. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they are taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Hey, pilot. Welcome back to Ready for Pushback. I am stoked that you're here. My name is Nick Fialka. If you are just joining us for the first time, welcome to the show. It's a great show. I like it. My mom likes it. She listens to it. And I hope that you like it. If you are back again for another episode, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. 2024 has really uh, ramped up to be an awesome year and uh, we're exploding. And a lot of you are sharing the show and telling more people about the show. If you can do that, if you're a pilot that listens and you get a lot out of this show, if you want to give back to me, you sharing the show and writing a review in uh, Apple podcast, that is literally, literally the two things that are important to this show. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I mean, you guys are the best. And so today's episode is a really good pragmatic overview of just an awesome guy. His name is Nick Tercy. It's all about getting a job in what his experience was like working his way up to get a job at the regionals and then getting on with an ultra low cost carrier and going to uh, hiring conventions. This convention was RTAG, the Rotary to Air Group. And we talk all about his experience. And the reason he wanted to be on the show is because he knows a lot of people have the same questions. He doesn't want people to make the mistakes he did. You'll hear the things that he did that happened to him at our tag that were very unexpected. So learn from that, listen to it. He's very gracious, a very kind individual to be able to spend time with us. And I got so much out of it. It's so fun to hear the conversation. And I'm telling you guys and gals, you need to get yourself to the hiring conventions. You need to come see our team, be part of our little family, but also get out there and network yourself. And this is what Nick is a pro at. And it's not cheap. It's not cheap. I'll tell you that. It's going to cost you about a grand to go to one of these things because unless if you fly for free, that's awesome. There'll be a little less money you don't have to pay, but you're going to have to get a hotel. You're going to have to have a suit on. You're going to have to uh, have some resumes. You're going to have to do all those things. And so it's just not cheap. And But you need to evaluate where you are in your career and where you want to go and let that be the driving force. So the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's what I'll say about that. If you would like to be on the show and you would like me to interview you, maybe you want a coaching call, maybe you have a great story, I'd love you to reach out to me. I always am uh, after great people to interview. Also, if you know somebody, if you know a director of hiring at a company or you know a person that is in management that you think I should speak to and you can hook us up, like, let's go. I'm happy. It doesn't matter whether it's 121, 135, flight schools, all those things. I love growing my network and I love just meeting people. So this is a great episode with Nick. You're really going to enjoy it. Sit back, relax. Let's get ready for pushback. Hey, pilot, did you just get a new conditional job offer? Are you getting out of the military and going to move your family across the country? Are you going to move in base somewhere or are you going to go out to find that second home that you've been looking for? Well, I want you to stop right now, pick up the phone and call Marty and the team at Trident Home Loans. It's an organization that's run by pilots. They understand pilot pay. They understand contracts. They understand military. They have the best VA loans in the United States. Marty and his team have been doing mortgages for years. They've been doing my mortgages for years. I trust him and his team more than any other organization. I challenge you to get a better deal anywhere else. Go ahead, reach out, get a mortgage quote, and then call Marty and his team. They will walk you through the process and show you how competitive their rates are. So go right now, tridenthomeloans.com and check them out. All right, pilot. I have a fun 
guest today. Nick Tercy is with us. How's it going, my man? It's going well. How are you doing today? I am doing great. I appreciate you joining and reaching out to me. And we have been trying to do this now for quite a while. So thanks for being flexible with your schedule. And I'm glad because I think that we have a really cool thing to talk about today. For the pilot at home, can you give me a general snapshot of your career? Just kind of a real quick look so they know where you've been. I'll dive into where we're going after that. Sure. Sounds good. So you and I actually started talking about a E2A council a while back. So I started out in the army, had nothing to do with aviation. I was infantry, spent 12 years there. I got out in 2018. I'll be honest, I had no interest in aviation. Well, I say no interest. I had no plan to go into aviation at the time. I sat down to dinner with a wonderful friend of mine, Victor. He's a captain at American Airlines right now. And he just asked me if I had any interest in being a pilot. And that kind of started me down a, a progression of working on my ratings from 2018. Obviously, COVID happened. It kind of adjusted the way that I was able to build hours. I got hired by Piedmont back in December of 2022. I started there, uh, spent one year at Piedmont, and then at the RTAG convention last year, which I highly recommend everyone go to. RTAG is awesome. Lots of opportunities there. Uh, I got an offer from Frontier to interview. I was not expecting it. I was very short on hours compared to what they say their minimums are. Uh, you were very gracious in letting me use your laptop so I could fill out their online pre-questionnaire exam thing. Uh, which was was quite the interesting event to fill out. Lots of questions on there that had me feeling like I was doing horribly. Uh, now I've been at Frontier since December. So I'm about five, six months in now and going strong. I'm enjoying the ULCC life at the moment. I love that you borrowed my computer. I had totally forgotten who had borrowed my computer, but I tell that story quite often because you came around the corner and you're a little bit in a panic mode about what am I going to do? I've got to go take this assessment. (laughs) And I was like, dude, just go. So I'll be honest. I had no intention of interviewing that weekend. I was at 1,380 hours. Uh, I had done a Meet the Chiefs event and they said, somehow I got the thanks but no thanks letter that they normally only send out after a bad interview. And I was like, well, I'm going to have 1,500 hours in like two months. Could you guys just waive this for me so I can actually apply an interview when I hit 1,500 hours? Of course, I said that's one of the chief pilots, just happened to be the Philadelphia chief pilot where I live. And he goes, yeah, you know, it's, I'm a little busy right now. It was right before we opened the doors. And he said, you know what, like, let me get back to you. I got an email about two hours later. Hey, would you like to interview? I didn't have my logbooks. I didn't have a laptop. I didn't have, I didn't have anything with me other than like my pilot's license and medical because that just lives in my wallet. I don't even think I had a suit. I was just there in, in the red volunteer shirt. And I was in a panic, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm not ready for an interview. I wasn't planning on this. And you were absolutely a savior that day. Dude, you are, first off, congratulations on getting the job. Second, you are a lesson for everybody that's listening to this podcast. Because I tell people, uh, I hear a lot of this. I hear people ask, telling me, hey, I'm just going to go to a convention to check it out. It's my first one. I know I don't qualify. I don't have applications. I don't have this. I don't have that. Whatever. And then all of the sudden, serendipity and the stars align and all the things happen. And danged if you're not right there in front of a recruiter and they're ready to interview you. And that just happens. And that's the, so you have to be on your game. You have to be ready and you have to be willing to pivot if you are in a pinch. And I'm not going to be at every convention to give everybody my computer. So. <laughs> No, but I mean, absolutely. Like, show up, have all of your applications in. Think about like applying to colleges, right? You've got your dream colleges, you've got your reach colleges, you've got the ones you feel comfortable in, and then you got your backups. Apply to all of them. There's no reason not to apply. It doesn't cost you. Okay, for the most part, it doesn't cost you anything not to apply. There's a couple of costs, but put the application in and just go in with the mentality of, yeah, I'm at 1,250 hours, I need 1,500. They might not interview me, but you know what? I can get a conversation going. And maybe, just maybe off of that conversation, maybe from that I can get the interview as long as I can start a conversation. A thousand percent. And a lot of the times with these recruiters, if you can just get a conversation going with them and show them that you're someone that they are interested in talking to, maybe not today, but tomorrow, there's a reason why it's called a conditional job offer. That condition can be based on a lot of things. It can be based on on getting out of the military. It can be based on hitting your hour requirements. It can be based on turning 23 and qualifying to get to a legacy if you're not there yet. They can put whatever conditions on it they want. There's no reason not to put the application. Don't self-select. 
Oh my gosh, dude. I have been talking about self-selecting and and pushing yourself out a lot. That has just been a big topic of conversation over my past month or two. And I love that this is where it's going. So you're absolutely right. I want to dive in a little bit on that time at Piedmont. All right. So you started, you said you started, I think December 22. Is that right? I did. So I actually got a offer over the summer. I was at about 700, 750 hours. I qualified for the thousand hour restricted. I had to finish out my hours. Just like I said, the conditional can be based off of anything. Like I did not have hours yet. So once I hit my hours, they sent me to ATP, CTP. I did that the first week of December. Then December 13th, I started in doc. So it was just after they started offering the bonuses uh, and obviously all the retention contract stuff that came with that. How much money are we talking about? It was either twelve or fifteen. I think it was twelve thousand. Twelve thousand dollars. And so, do you remember? Did they hand you a paper check? Did they do a direct deposit? What did they do? It came, I believe, as a separate check tied with your first paycheck, basically. So I reported to Indoc. It came as a separate deposit, but it showed up the same day as as my first paycheck did, or or it showed up slightly before that. I think. Got it. And was it a flat twelve thousand dollars? Flat twelve thousand. Nothing was taken out of it, which. If you're coming off of flight instructing, $12,000 is like the most money you've seen since you started down the aviation tracks. It was a huge sum of money to me at that moment. So they didn't tax anything when you got the money? They did not. It was a straight bonus, if I remember right, which meant that I ended up having to deal with taxes on the back end for it. Yeah. And so you got that at the end of 2022 and you're rolling into 2023. I'm not a tax guy, but did you have to work through those taxes for 2023? I did. So I ended up having to file it as essentially income from Piedmont. It was still considered income from them. I paid, however, $1,500, $2,000, whatever it was. I I honestly don't remember in taxes. Very immediately after, I basically got the money. And as soon as the year started and I got my paperwork, I filed the taxes so that I would not be inclined to overspend that bonus money and put myself into a bad position. So the leftover money, did you just go ahead and spend that or did you put it aside? What'd you do? So I started December 17th and I think December 14th, I proposed to my now wife. So all that money just went straight toward wedding planning. (laughs) Of course. Excellent. Excellent. I love that. It was well spent. Yeah, (laughs) of course. Yes. (laughs) So you're reminded. I love it. Timothy P. Pope is a certified financial planner dedicated to guiding professional pilots through smart financial planning. Whether it's saving for retirement, investment management, a seamless military transition, or strategic tax planning, Tim is your trusted financial partner. Also, you can join Tim as he leads engaging discussions on personal finance and strategies for professional pilots on the brand new Pilot Money Podcast. Timothy P. Pope helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Okay, so you've got this job at Piedmont. You took a bonus. Now the bonus is what, a hundred grand or something crazy? Oh, it's getting crazy. It's all stacked at this point. So it's not individual bonuses that are that much. The way they do it, if I remember right, is there's a bonus for getting hired. There's a retention bonus. There's a bonus for upgrading the captain. There's a retention bonus for staying as a captain. It sums out to quite a a large, a large, large sum of money. It does come incrementally. You're not going to get it all your first day. Yes, absolutely. Did you have to sign a contract or anything when you got that bonus? I did. And honestly, part of the reason that I went to Piedmont and not PSA was PSA had a non-compete in their contract, which I don't know if it was very enforceable, but Piedmont did not. So I had to sign a contract saying that I would give the money back if I left within, I think it was two years of date of hire. So unfortunately, I did end up paying that back. It was a little bit of a hit, but ended up being worth in the long run, I think. How long were you at Piedmont before you got hired by Frontier? So I started in Doc December 13th. Our tag convention was October 27th or some, somewhere thereabout. And then I actually started at Frontier December 27th. Took a little while to get my background checks through. Yeah. So essentially, you were at Piedmont for about a year. And uh, so you're halfway through. Did you have to repay half that money or did you have to repay the entire thing? I had to repay the entire sum. There were rumors going around of they would prorate it if you're at a certain point and they did not offer to prorate it. Looking back, I probably should have gone to them and said, hey, you know, I, I don't really have this money. I'm going to have to take out a loan for it. Can we work on how much I can repay you? I've heard some people have had very good results with that. They've been able to 
kind of meet in the middle, so to speak, and not repay the entire 12000 Fortunately, Frontier had just begun giving out hiring bonuses. Uh, I got the first set, the 30000 So I just kind of took it as like, okay, I did this to myself. I'll accept my punishment. Uh, I'll give you 12 of the 30 that I just got. And the rest of it looks like that's going toward paying down the remainder of the wedding that I was still paying on at that point. Listen, I've done that to you. I I paid for uh, my wedding out of pocket for sure, but that was like 13 years ago. So things were not as expensive as they were in the past two years. Fortunately, we did it very inexpensively. I don't know about your opinion, but I am not much of a cake person. Neither is my wife. So we did a pie bar instead that was all made by friends and family. So we were able to cut expenses here and there and make it fairly reasonable. And then the rest of them, I just went toward paying off old credit card debt and everything else to try and get back to a more even keel on debt. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so important. It's so tricky when you are working through your ratings, especially as an adult, as you're, if you are a second career person and you have all these other obligations that you've accumulated over the past eight or 10 or 15 years, and then you go into this world of flight training, it makes it very difficult to keep your head above water and not to end up crushed with debt. So good on you for getting back to a zero position. Yeah, I got uh, I got myself most of the way back to a zero position, and I I put a good bit of it toward my wife's outstanding debt. I honestly I wish I'd found this as a second career. This is technically a third career for me. I had a, a civilian career before. I did active duty for a while, and then the third iteration for me. But I was lucky because of the military. I was able to use what's called VR and D. Um, I describe it as GI Bill plus everything that you never thought that you could get the GI Bill to cover. If you're a veteran, I highly recommend you look into this if you have a disability rating. They were able to cover most of my flight training, made it a lot more affordable. I have a lot of friends that are obviously civilian pilots that never did any military service. They didn't have GI Bill. It's astounding the amount of debt that comes with this industry. And my Lord, (laughs) people need to start applying for some of these scholarships. I've talked to a few people. Actually, I think I heard on one of your podcasts recently too. There are just so many scholarships, barely get any applications to them. I don't know how people are paying for this out of pocket, but good on you if you're able to afford it. But if not, you should probably be trying to find secondary sources of income if you're able to. That's right. Do you remember what VR and E stands for? I believe it's vocational rehabilitation and it's either employment or education. education. They changed it recently. I can't remember which one went to which. That's right. And so for those of you that are veterans listening to this, it is an opportunity that the, the VA provides a certain amount of money for veterans to essentially change careers. And it gives you an opportunity to get things paid for. And one of those things are a certain amount of flight ratings and things like that. So definitely dive into it. I probably need mm-hmm. to get a vr e specialist on here to have that discussion. That's a great idea. So anyone who's interested, there's a YouTube channel called I Am Nick the Vet. It's not spelled like your Nick or my Nick. It has a C. She is not aviation specific, but she has a whole YouTube series on how to use vr e how to qualify for it what they can and cannot do. It's an amazing resource. I I recommend it to people all the time. I'll give a little shout out here. So I'm part of SkyBridge. We do aviation skill bridges for people getting out of the military. I'm constantly recommending people apply to that as soon as they get their their disability ratings. That's perfect. I will, of course, always have a link to SkyBridge and uh, my boys Landon and Austin over there. And also I'll get a link to I Am Nick the Vet YouTube channel in the show notes. So it'll just be a quick click away for anybody that wants to take a look at it. Do you feel like when you left PS or correction, when you left Piedmont, there was a weird tension? Like, did you feel uneasy about it or were you just ready to rock and roll? And here's my two weeks notice and I'll see you. I don't necessarily think that there was a tension about it. So I let them know December 24th that I was leaving. Uh, I was advised by multiple people not to give two weeks notice, which turned out to be the right advice. Uh, I immediately got an email back. Okay. Termination is effective as of 24 hours from now. Please turn in all your equipment. I'll be completely honest. The state of the industry at the time, they had substantially more first officers on the books than they had captains. Let's face it. We were coming out of COVID. Everyone hired before COVID had enough time to upgrade the captain, meaning they also had enough time to leave original and get to wherever they want to go, be it a ULCC or a legacy or whatever they want to do. Everyone hired after COVID didn't have enough hours to upgrade to captain. So there were a lot of people where there was just a gap there. And that's a large part of the reason in my eyes why FO hiring stopped at regionals for so long was because they didn't have enough captains to fill planes. So why have three times as many FOs as captains? It's not Financially, it's not a good decision. 
So I think that they were honestly probably just happy to have one more person off their books that they weren't having to pay uh, the, a captain that wasn't you know making aircraft move at the time. Yeah, that certainly is, it continues to this day that the people that are captains and the people that are senior first officers, when they are looking to leave, they are getting plucked up quickly. If they're not looking to leave and they don't have apps out, they're never going to get plucked up. And I, I meet people like that quite often, surprisingly, but people are enjoying the ride right now that are making upwards of $400 an hour that are line check airmen at regionals and this crazy money. There is also a half-life to it. So it's a balance and a little bit of a gamble whether or not you're going to stay there or move on because when the music stops, music stops and you don't get to choose where you are at that point. Hey, pilot, does your pilot uniform make a short flight feel like a transcon slog? Flight uniforms have reinvented aviation shirts. With 3D stretch, stain repellents, and no wrinkles, these shirts are just plain comfortable and ready for takeoff right out of your rollerboard. Flight Uniform is trusted by more than 25,000 pilots, and their flagship flight shirt has over 1,500 five star reviews. I've worn every pilot shirt out there, and if you know me, you know I only wear flight uniforms. Be the envy of every cockpit at flightuniform.com and get a special podcast exclusive discount with the code SPITFIREPOD20 to take 20% off your first order. That's SPITFIREPOD20, all one word, for 20% off your first order at flightuniform.com. Yeah. So obviously, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages with everything. But one, like you said, those numbers are are temporary. They have an expiration date on that $400 an hour to be a line check airman. And as a lot of them are finding out, that money is only there when you're executing line check airman duties. So when there was a large gap where they had stopped hiring and they didn't really have anyone that was eligible for upgrade, no one was making $400 an hour because they weren't executing line check airman duties. Yeah, it's absolutely true. So what's the experience been like at Frontier? I will say that they have a very unique business model uh, when compared to the legacies and obviously the regionals that I'm used to. Their business model is we take people from point A to where they want to go. I'm going to emphasize where they want to go as inexpensively as possible. So our flying really focuses around getting people to Florida, to Cancun, Puerto Rico. I think we just announced today that we have the most direct flights to Puerto Rico or the most service to Puerto Rico, something like that. So it's, it's a very different business model. Regionals was all about getting people from small airports to big airports so that the main line could take them from big airport to big airport. And then if they needed to, they'd get another regional out to a small airport. Frontier is all about, we're going to take you where you want to go. And if people don't want to go there, there's no good reason for us to service it. Like no one's going to go to Billings, Montana. So we're not going to do a lot of flights to Billings, Montana. We'll do every flight will go through Miami though because people want to go to Miami. It's a very different business model. Training there was overall very good. It's the, the A320 is a phenomenal aircraft. It's the absolute pinnacle of 1980s computerized flight technology, for better or worse. Obviously, there's been some improvements since then, but it's still a very modernized, very efficient flight deck. Uh, you know, Everything's easy to find. It all makes sense where it is. The flying itself is, by comparison to a regional, it's great. I haven't done a single five-leg day since I've been there, which is great. I can't tell you how much I despise five leg days and even more four day trips. What I found when I got to a regional was I don't want to be gone for four days at a time. It's it's not appealing to me. Frontier has this primarily one and two day trip business model that for me is phenomenal. It's exactly what I want. I joke all the time. I spent a lot of money on a sleep number bed. It's a very, very nice bed. And I'm not going to throw that money away. I want to sleep in that very nice bed. So one and two day trips are perfect for me. Yeah, the model, Frontier switched that model last year mm -hmm. of uh, heavily one and two day trips. And most, uh, one of the business cases for that is they have to pay for less hotels for pilots. And that's, a, you know, that's a win for them as a company. They're always looking to find a way to be efficient and effective with their money. And so that's one of the ways. What that did, do, I'm guessing you live in base. Is that correct? I do. Uh, I live about 30 minutes from the Philadelphia airport, which is one of their more junior bases. So for me, as someone who lives in base, it's great. I will say this was a move that probably violated a lot more commuters than they expected to, which I'm sure has been one of the causes of their attrition lately. Yeah, you're probably right. I think that 
the if you are a commuter, you got to think about it. If you're a commuter and you have a one day trip and you commute in for that one day trip, man, you have to get it. You either have to commute home or get a hotel. And then a day or two later, you're going to have a two day trip and you got to commute in. Maybe you'll get a hotel for the night and then you got to, you know, figure out how to get home. So it makes it untenable if you need to commute in. You have to get more hotels than usual. Most people plan like four to six hotels a month or a crash pad or something like that. But if you're doing, you know, 13 one day trips, that's a ton. That's exponentially more money depending on what time you're leaving and what time you get back. And so that makes it a real, really difficult thing for commuters. But if you live in base, man, it's a sweet, sweet thing. It's almost an Allegiant model. Yeah. And it seems like they really are pushing a little bit more toward that Allegiant mentality. Uh, Obviously, they've added several bases recently. Their plan is to add several more. Barry Biffle actually stopped into our new hire class and talked to us a little bit about that. He said, we didn't expect to see several more bases added, probably one, maybe two a year for the next couple of years was kind of What he was saying then, obviously plans change a little bit, but Phoenix has just opened. Dallas has just opened. They're actively considering something in Ohio, I think either Cincinnati or or something like that. There's a couple up there that are kind of in the running right now and they're they're trying to figure out where it's going to be. But it, it sounds like they are moving a little bit more toward that Allegiant style of many bases and fewer day trips. Their argument is it makes it easier to recover if something goes wrong with the weather. The counter argument is you're not going to get anybody who's a commuter because no one wants to spend that much time in a crash pad. Yeah, you're right. But I think that the idea here now is that the people that are getting hired have that understanding Mm -hmm. that this is a company with one or two day trips. It's tricky for the people that were already there and were already commuting and then were surprised with that. So that's tricky, but it's also a good lesson on this industry. The fact that things change and the company gets to decide what the company is going to do. You could be at United in the San Francisco base and then all of a sudden they decide they're going to close the base and they're going to realign everything to Denver. And you've been living on the West Coast in California for 20 years and now you have to commute to Denver. Um, Delta did that in Dallas. They shut down Dallas. They had a base there for a long, long time. And those pilots, I've seen them, they still commute. Dallas is one of the hardest places to commute to Atlanta from because there are so many pilots of, that just put down roots in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And they, you know, it's just how the game is played. Pittsburgh, look at Pittsburgh and uh, US Air. That used to be one of their biggest bases. It's full of older guys that are commuting from Pittsburgh mm-hmm. uh, down to DC or, or wherever they're going, Charlotte or where have you. There are many, many cases that, you know, if, Really, if you want to live in base and you're the best one to live in is the hive, you know, the headquarters, whether it's going to be Denver or Atlanta or DFW or wherever, if you can live there, you're less likely (laughs) to commute because if they shut down that base, that means you just lost your airline. So worst of the worst, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's certainly a very different problem at that moment. Now you're going back into the open market and you have no job as compared to you have to commute. There's cer- certainly different issues that come to play there. That's right, and that's when the uh, you can get uh, you can go buy yourself a truck and go sell chickens across the Midwest <laughs> and uh, do what you got to do. I know somebody that did that, and it's a very interesting story. Oh, I'm sure. So, dude, I appreciate you coming in and spending this time and giving this great case study on what it's like to go from nothing to a regional and all of a sudden snapped up into the ULCC. And I know there's so many different roads and so many different things that people are doing, but I feel like the fact that you had to pay back the bonus, you had to make amends and you had to pivot and work hard and expect the unexpected, but you've rolled with it and you've been successful with that and you're at a great place. I'm really proud of you. And I'm really glad when we first met back in October till now, You've just done great things. So thank you for coming on the show and thank you for spending time with the pilot that's listening here, helping them understand your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Much to my wife's uh, uh, chagrin, I guess, I end up spending more time than I plan on talking to random people about aviation career planning. So this is something where for me, this was never a career that I expected I'd be able to get into. I had no idea this was an option. Anything that I can do to help people figure out their way to make this work and make it be what they want it to be, I will, I'm 
always interested in having a conversation, doing what I can to, to help you get to that point. All right, pilots, that's the episode. I hope you've really enjoyed it. But before you go, do me a quick favor, subscribe to my show and leave me a review. Give me a one-star review if it was totally worthless. Give me a five-star review if it was the most amazing thing you've ever heard. I want to hear from you. So if you can give me a review, subscribe to the podcast, make yourself a little bit better. I will be happy. You'll be happy. We'll keep crushing. I cannot wait to see you on the next episode.